Yes. Do you believe that creating an overpopulated world is a moral thing to do? First of all, there's a question of who's creating, right? So it's being created is not by one person, it's by individuals. Um, I don't think there's an overpopulated world. I mean, to put it more bluntly, I know there's not an overpopulated world. Uh, I mean, today's, even, at, even with all the restraints we have today on human ingenuity, thanks to the anti-human environmental movement, even with all of those, it's still the best fed population in history. So the premise behind overpopula overpopulation as a, as a problem is the idea that nature gives us scarce <coughs> resources uh, and that we deplete them. And yet, if you ask your, it's an interesting question to ask, do we have more usable resources today or, or 300 years ago? Today, okay, but we have way more people, we've consumed all these resources and yet we have more. Why? Well, it's because if you understand, it's, it's because resources aren't taken from nature and they're created from nature. So, show of hands, is aluminum a valuable natural resource? Yes, who says yes? Yes. Who says no? Okay. Yeah. Why isn't it? You raise your hand. Why isn't it natural resource? You don't like aluminum? <laughs> I mean, it's just, there's a lot of it. It's just not like, there's almost too much of it. Oh, so you think it's too much? Well, but interestingly, so there's, there was even more, or the same amount, hundreds of years ago, and it was completely useless. So it's one of the most abundant elements in the earth, but it was useless. It wasn't a resource. A resource is something you have available to use and gain value from. So in order to make it a resource, we needed to use human ingenuity to turn <coughs> the unusable raw material into a usable resource. So it's the same thing with coal. Is coal a valuable re natural resource? <coughs> Not until we make it so. Is oil? Is gas? So with nuclear, that's just some random metal, right? But human ingenuity makes it into a resource. So there's no reason to think that we couldn't sustain a population of 20 billion. Now the actual problem today is that the higher population levels are in poorer countries which tend to have worse <coughs> political policies and worse economies. So that's, that's the real problem, is getting better economies, getting better policies there. So we can talk about how to do that. Uh, and energy is certainly helpful. In the developed world, it's that we're mostly losing population. <coughs> and that's, that's the more alarming thing, particularly because people have, uh, which is not something I agree with, but people have created these enormous entitlement states that they you know, have uh, pledged all this future money to, and then they have declining populations. Uh, basically, resources, since resources can be created and human beings are resource creators, we don't have to worry about overpopulation. We do have to worry about under freedom, the lack of freedom, which is, that's the real thing that causes starvation. Yes? How do we create, or how do we like communicate a message like, like this appealing message of a human flourishing to a, our world today? Like how do we do that in an effective way? That's a good question. Well, one thing is, if you put your email on one of those cards, I'll send you, uh, a template for it, but the basic thing is just in every conversation you have to be clear. Whenever you're talking to someone, you have to have sort of like two rules that you both agree to. So whatever comes up, so let's say we're talking, let's, let's say you bring up CO2, like we're putting CO, too much CO2 in the atmosphere. I'll say, okay, great, let's talk about that. Um, and you know, you say we're putting too much CO2 in the atmosphere and I think we should dramatically reduce fossil fuels. Okay, great, let's talk about that. So I'd say the first thing I'd say is, would you agree that the goal of whatever policy we end up with is, is the best outcome for human beings? And they'll say yes. So I just did it, right? I just made our standard human flourish. And then to add on top of that, what's really important is I'll say, and would you agree that we have to look carefully at the positives and negatives of all the alternatives? Not just, you know, the positive, we'd not be biased. So that's what I call the full context. So if you get human flourishing in the full context, if you get those and you get clarity on the question, then you can have a really good discussion. So um, again, I'm happy, I'll, I'll, you'll see that framework that I send out, but that took me a long time to figure out, but I live in San Francisco and I have no trouble. <laughs> yes? Um, so I would actually argue that you can create human flourishing through renewable energy. Uh, I was in, I studied in Costa Rica last semester, it's, um, it's a developing country. They don't have, they have $12,000 uh, $12, per year per person GDP on average. 
Um, and that has grown from 4,000 since their Civil War because they're 99% non-renewable energy resources based on hydroelectric, based on geothermal, solar, and wind, those mm -hmm. four primarily. Um, they're 99% on that, which has created thousands of jobs there. It, their number one employer in the entire country is the company who runs all that ESA. Uh -huh. And it's grown their national GDP because they sell extra energy that they, that they make but don't use to other Central American countries. Mm. And so I actually see human flourishing there because of renewable energy resources that they brought up. Mm. And it was actually paid for by, of course, like carbon, uh, carbon using countries who are trying to offset their carbon by mm. paying for it in developing countries, but it has created so much good things there, and I don't see how that can be applied in other countries like in Africa. Sure. So, first of all, the, the human flourishing doesn't say by itself whether in any given situation fossil fuels or hydro or geothermal. You have to actually look at the specific situation. So, let's take Washington. Uh, Washington State, right? So Washington State has a lot of hydro resources and they use them and they get very affordable, um, you know, very affordable electricity. So to say I'm in favor of human flourishing does not mean I'm against that, it means I'm for that kind of thing. The same is true, let's say Iceland is I think, a better example than Costa Rica, but Iceland has, for various reasons, very good uh, geothermal resources. So absolutely, every place should use the best form of energy for the job. Now, when you say it creates thousands of jobs, that's a huge red flag in my mind because, in general, the more jobs an industry creates, the less efficient it is. So that 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 means that it's it's very resource inefficient to the extent that's true. Uh, but to the extent that they're using, I would say, hydro and geothermal would be the efficient ones there. Maybe geothermal, almost definitely hydro. To the extent they're doing that they're doing a good thing and they're following my policy of intelligently transforming nature. To the extent though that you have places that don't have those resources, that aren't naturally suited to hydro or geothermal, and then you say, oh, it worked in Iceland, therefore it's gonna work in the middle of Africa, you know, that, you know, in the desert, that would be a mistake. So um, to be for fossil fuels doesn't mean to mandate fossil fuels or to be, have a fetish for it. It means to believe that people should be free to use it when they choose to. And today we're in a situation where the vast majority of people in the vast majority of situations choose fossil fuels, and we should have a market where other industries are free to outcompete them and aren't restricted, which is again why I'm in favor of, of, of taking away all the irrational limitations on, on the nuclear. So yeah, but it's not renewable, it's not, it's not being anti-renewable. I don't think renewable is a clear way of thinking about it because no, there's no renewable process. That's why I made the distinction between a reliable and unreliable. Costa Rica, it's not all of that because all of its food is <coughs> oil based but, um, for transportation, but to whatever extent its grid is reliable, it's because of reliables. And it's important that the green movement is the biggest opponent of hydroelectric. Okay. Yes? Is the environmental movement really restricting the development of fossil fuels yes. in developing nations? Yes. Well, first of all, as I mentioned before, any restriction anywhere, so it's a global commodity. So anytime you restrict, if you take oil, anytime you make the price of oil more expensive, the poorest person suffers most. So let's say you have an economy where they're trying to build new buildings, something like that, and the oil is more expensive, that makes it more expensive to build new buildings. Or farming would be an even better example. They're trying to mechanize their farming, the price of oil goes up, their price is good. So there's the, the cost of energy is, is overwhelmingly a global thing, particularly for oil, and to a slightly lesser extent, coal, and then to a significantly lesser extent, uh, natural gas, for various reasons. But um, So they're doing it by restricting it in the developed countries, but also because of the way international uh, welfare works, there's a long history of the green movement getting various welfare payments tied to following policies. So for example, uh, with the, the you know, molecular compound DDT, which was incredible at fighting malaria, uh, the US and other governments tied their aid to banning DDT, which killed literally millions of people. Um, and it's just a total human crisis. But the point is that now they didn't, the US didn't forbid it in the Sri Lanka, but it would say, well, we're not going to give you aid unless you ban DDT. So what, what's happening right now is the developed countries are, I think, almost always very intrusive 
in terms of on a governmental level in sort of quote unquote helping people. And the way they're helping people is very politically correct. So the, the, the term you might hear if you study the literature is called leapfrogging. So they'll say, oh yeah, you guys don't need coal and oil and gas and nuclear. You can leapfrog and just have solar panels. And they have a really bad analogy about cell phones and solar panels that, that doesn't work at all. Uh, it's hard to even explain, but, but they'll just say, oh well, basically they'll say, well we didn't, they went from, from straight to cell phones instead of using landlines, so they can go straight to solar panels. But the thing is, cell phones are really efficient and solar panels aren't uh, at, at, at the scale that they need electricity. Again, if they just want to power a flashlight, then it's okay. If you look at things like, I don't know if anyone laughed at that, but if you, look at, if you look at what the UN says for like development goals, it's things like you can have a flashlight for five hours a day. Um, any other, yes, you. I'm confused about the sustainability of pursuing fossil fuels where I do agree that using 100% renewable resources would cover just a fraction of the energy, but at the same time, if we just use fossil fuels, the Earth produces it very slowly. There's a lot there. I've heard that a lot of it is very deep in the Earth, and there's very uh, dense layer of rock that uh -huh. is very hard to drill through. So <coughs> it seems like we would use it faster than the Earth could produce it, along with faster than we would actually even access the copious amounts lower down. Uh -huh. And so it would improve uh, human life and flourish it in the short term, from what I can understand. But mm -hmm. then as the population grows, we use more of it, consume it at an increasing rate. And then at some point, we'll be stuck without an answer when we run out of fossil fuels mm -hmm. for the time being until the Earth creates more and at a pretty slow rate. Right. So I don't know. I'm having trouble understanding the morality. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. That so that's, a, that's an important question. Another pitch. Um, hopefully, you fill out the cards. I can send a summary of moral case for fossil fuels. So, this is there are three basic objections to fossil fuel use. One is, is what's called the catastrophic depletion argument, which is this one we're going to deplete it all and run out. Then there's catastrophic pollution and then catastrophic climate change. So, with this one, it's important to know what it means and doesn't mean to support fossil fuels. So if I say I advocate fossil fuels and make a moral case, what that does not mean is that I'm saying everyone should use fossil fuels for all time, no matter what, forever, and just, you know, until we run out. That's, that's I mean, I wouldn't say that of my phone. I wouldn't say, which is also non-renewable, right? So there are non-renewable things in this phone. And yet nobody's saying, well, I want a renewable, sustainable phone, right? Why? Because you have an idea that phones are evolving. So if any of the inputs of the phone, uh, A, will always look for better forms of phone, and B, if any of the inputs we ran short on, we'd find something else. So what we have uh, is, a, is an evolutionary progressive process for deciding what to consume. And that process, which is inherent in capitalism, applies to energy just like anything else. It applies to metal, it applies to everything. So what it says that fossil fuels are good means that it is a good thing for people to be free to choose fossil fuels and to choose them, and that they're choosing them for good reasons. Now, in terms of how much of the stuff there is, that might determine whether it's 50 years or 100 years or 500 years or 1,000 years. People tend to underestimate how much there is. Um, but all it says is use it as long as it's the best. So the human flourishing, as the overarching concept says, use whatever will be the best. So sustainability, I don't think, is the right way to think of life. Because sustainability really prizes repetitiveness. It says, let's figure out something that I can do over and over and over, and that's quote sustainable. But human beings aren't sustainable. We're progressive. We're evolving. We find better and better ways of doing things. So I think of myself as I support progressive energy, which is the best energy, the best process that we can figure out at any given time. And so at a given point, that'll be hydrocarbons or fossil fuels. It'll be nuclear. It might be fusion. Uh, but if we have a free enough country with enough ingenuity, you know, we'll never run out of the stuff. We'll, we'll just keep running in, into new stuff. But to get there, to get to the next best source of energy in the future, you need to be free to use the best source of energy. <coughs> so what I'm saying is we should be free to use the best source of energy now as part of the evolutionary flourishing process. Follow up? Uh, quickly, yes. So with if we're not pursuing, uh, like you said, that with fossil fuels, that we should just use it to use it up. It sounds like with America, we already 
aren't that sustainable and we're reaching really high peaks. And then your two babies example where... Wait, wait, why are we reaching high... I don't know what you mean by reaching high peaks. We're, like, we're using so much because our, like, we're just such a busy country. And that's not necessarily bad, but we're just at an unsustainable rate where everyone in the world use the amount that we use, but there's just not enough matter in the world to hold that. So... Okay, but that's just me. <laughs> I would disagree with that. But, okay, but you're going to tell me the statistics to back that up? Because I, I know the statistics that refute it. Do you have the statistics? Well, but you just said you made a specific quantitative claim about matter. Would, Could you let him finish his question, please? Um, are you the judge? I, he, first of all, he asked two questions and made a comment, and it's my job if he says something untrue to point that out. And so, you're the lecturer that has time to bring statistics, and he's just a student. So I'm sure if he would have time, he has much research as he oh. would have the statistics. But he just came to the lecture. Great. So okay. Just to summarize, um, you made a claim that was untrue. You have some supporters over here, but it was an untrue claim. So I asked you if you could back it up with numbers, and you said no. I would say that there is a certain amount of matter on the Earth right now, and like some of it enters and some of it leaves. Uh -huh. Not all of that is useful to produce energy, I would say. Uh -huh. or use, or it all produces energy, but it might not necessarily be energy that is useful to okay. goals okay. that we want. And if everyone in the world had that level, it wouldn't last very long before it just became energy that wasn't usable for us. Okay, so, so I think, um, I just recommend chapter eight of the more case for the for the data on this. I think it's, Absolutely, I think we could use 10 times more energy with no, no problem. You would use different sources, and but ultimately, the nuclear, you have no limits uh, for practical purposes. So you would end up going there. Yes? So I'm just wondering, um, because as far as the relationship between CO2 and heat and projections about that, um, we've got different views on that. But as far as the relationship between increasing amounts of CO2 and like acidity of the ocean, mm -hmm. from what I've heard, and that's not very much, so I'm wondering your take. It seems like that's a pretty decent relationship, mm -hmm. and I've seen projections, you know, that that's hurting some ecosystems and could hurt like fishing industries and stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you weigh in on the whole acidity versus CO2. Thing. Sure. Um, so with any of the issues with CO2, whether it's in the atmosphere or in the ocean, really two key concepts are magnitude. So we want to see like how big an impact is, not just that there is an impact, because there's, there's always an impact. And then ultimately consequence on on human life. Um, so, I mean, I think the atmospheric one is more interesting. But if you take the ocean, so what the acidity thing means, um, you know, the way any given part of the ocean will be is that it'll have a it'll have a pH range, right? So, seven is neutral, right? So, no, but people are confused because they, let's say in certain places it might be between seven point four and eight point one. So it's uh, alkaline. Right, and so what's already happening happening in that area is that the fishes or coral or whatever they're already adapted to that range. It's not that they have this one little thing. It's not it's the same with temperature. Temperature exists in these ranges, and they're adapted. So, what you would need for that to be like a real, real issue is a significant shift in the range, where like a significant portion of their lives are in a very different spot. And here you're talking about very minor shifts in the range relative to what they're doing. So what happens is most of these things get debunked, um, but that's the reason why. But yes, in general, the more CO2 in the, you have in the atmosphere, the more you'll have in the ocean. But it's not acidifying. So acidifying is a propaganda term because saying less basic would not be as scary. Right? If you say the ocean is a little less basic, if you say, oh, it's acid, then you think, oh, it's like a cauldron. Your rainwater is like sick. So this is all just all propaganda. What, it's the kind of thing you should see, but the, the impacts are fairly um, you know, minor, and in terms of effect on human life, our ability to benefit from the oceans, the things that are affecting that the most are the green restrictions on development. So for example, people talk about fisheries. What we really need is mass aquaculture like we have agriculture. Right now, we're not using at all the potential of the ocean because we think the ocean is perfect and we shouldn't be able to change anything. So what really there's this lost opportunity for human flourishing. The acidification is a is a um, is a dodge or is, is a diversion. The other thing to look at, by the way, whenever you hear a new issue brought up and it somehow becomes popular, because this is not a new. Everyone knows about this issue. The, the chemistry of it is known 
forever. So why is acidification, why did acidification, as they call it, or debasification, uh, why did that become an issue? Yes? Uh, one reason is populations of coral, like in reefs, I think near Central America, seem to be getting bleached and dying, which was another, which is kind of a follow-up, is, is there another reason for that besides CO2? So in a given situation, first of all, there's different, like different reporting on things, but so I'm not, I'm not a coral expert, I can tell the, in, in general, no, but it, and it's worth looking into it, and it's hypothetically possible that there would be, I mean, any change in the global ecosystem will lead to negative things for some things and negatives, uh, positives for the others. So what I'm saying is you need to look carefully at the full context, including the impact on human beings, see how much it matters overall, see what benefits, uh, what loses. But, oh, but the real reason it became an issue is because the temperature, dramatic temperature increases predicted by climate catastrophes didn't happen, and so they needed a new thing to pick on. And this is always a dishonest movements, that's always a, a common practice, is when your predictions are wrong, instead of owning up to them being wrong, uh, you pick another catastrophe to predict. I mean, the, the most conspicuous example of this was the uh, global cooling, global warming thing, where the, the green movement, um, you know, many of them predicted that the um, you know, various particles and emissions from fossil fuels would make the Earth freeze, and then during a period where it was getting cooler, and then it started getting warmer, and then suddenly they thought, oh no, the greenhouse effect is the dominant thing. Now both of these effects were dominant, <coughs> but which one they, they chose was based on their current uh, agenda. And then, by the way, they went back, and if you look at how they've changed, if you, it's really interesting to look at the government's temperature records and how they've changed, how they retroactively figure out that they were wrong. So even though you have all these records in the 70s of it getting cold, now they've basically made it getting get warm because that's more consistent with their theory. So at the time, it was obviously getting cold, so they needed to claim fossil fuels were causing global cooling, but then they said they're causing global warming, but then it was inconvenient that it had cooled during that period, so now it gets smooth. Um, yes? Uh, so in your book, you mention how, you talk about the some anti-fossil fuel people talking about the, um, a couple decades ago, uh -huh. but it wasn't really clear to me when did the anti-fossil movement start and who or what started it. Okay, um, sure. So the the movement, the anti-fossil fuel movement, is is a, a big faction of what I call the green movement or the I call it the anti-human environmental movement. So this started this the modern form of it started in the late '60s. This was the movement that started um, Earth Day. And during its history, it's had different causes that were very critical of, of different industries. So early on, it was very anti-nuclear. That was its focus. It wasn't particularly anti-fossil fuel. And it was very anti-chemicals. So like things like DDT and other things like that. Um, and, and it was very anti-consumption. And it was actually very anti-technology. So if you look at the literature in the 70s, they'd say technology is bad. Um, They'd say it's wrong because we're, we're tampering with nature. They're against biotech. And I'd say in the 70s, really, and certainly the 80s, a lot of it focused on uh, being anti-fossil fuel as their motive. So 70s and 80s is when it becomes that. And then really in the mid to late 80s, when Al Gore became prominent and a climate scientist named James Hansen became prominent, he's one of the ones who made those predictions, uh, then it became a huge issue. And then, you know, when Al Gore came out with an inconvenient truth in 2006, and it became a really, really big issue. So the basic, the basic movement is the anti-human impact movement, and the fossil fuel anti-fossil fuel movement is part of it. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Um, as far as the language of the anti-human movement, mm -hmm. um, my understanding with the green movement is not that they're trying to take away fossil fuels from developing countries or low-income areas, but rather that they're trying to go after large companies and corporations <coughs> that are causing a lot of damage to the environment through carbon emissions and other things like that. And I know you're arguing the level of impact of that, but that being said, if these big, big companies are causing really any scale of harm to the environment, mm -hmm. that does affect people on a global scale. And in that context, the people who are 
um, in developing countries are really the ones that are being negatively impacted by high income areas. And so I'm a little confused by your language saying that the Green Movement is anti-human when mm -hmm. really they're trying to defend people who might not be able to defend the environment themselves and it's really targeting low income mm -hmm. areas, um, yeah. especially considering the fact that, I don't know, my understanding of renewable <coughs> sustainable energy <coughs> costs money to set up in the first place, but then has very low maintenance and to high payoff over the long term, especially as that technology develops and becomes more widespread, whereas using fossil fuels and non-renewable energies require a constant influx of uh -huh. money and might not even be the most financially available option okay. long term. Yeah. So let's, let's um, so the question to me really raises the need for a different kind of environmental movement in the following sense. Uh, certain things that I wouldn't single out corporations, but that human beings can do, that individuals can do, that corporations can do, can be damaging to their own health and certainly can be damaging to the health of others. And this is why we all value clean air and clean water and we want to be safe. And these are very important issues. And what happened with these issues is that they were, the, the movement that expressed the most concern for them starting in the 60s and 70s was the green movement. And so the way they framed it was, we're making too much impact and we need to reduce our impact. So they packaged it under, they packaged our concern with the good environment as too much impact and we want to have less impact. But as I've explained a lot, that is not the right way to think about it because we survive by impact. So we need to make a lot of impact, it just needs to be positive. So the way to think about our environment is we want to make as much positive impact for human beings and minimize negative impact. So in what I'm calling the human flourishing movement, that would totally take care of any actual abuses, but it would also completely support industrial development. Whereas what the, the Green Movement is doing in practice that far outweighs anything that's done that's good is it is restricting industrial development. So I mentioned the example of DDT. <coughs> so like tens of millions of people who died uh, from lack of DDT. Uh, the issue of energy poverty, that's billions of people whose progress is being slowed or in some cases denied. Now with every, I mentioned this as well, with every bad movement that's anti-human, they always have a kind of flimsy argument that they really care about you. So the thing you mentioned with the unreliables, um, that's one of their flimsy arguments. Oh, it's gonna be better for you in the long run, it's gonna be cheaper. That's, well, if, it's, if that's what it is, then don't restrict fossil fuels, let it compete in the free market. Because as I indicated with the unreliables, they always need to be backed up by reliables. So they're not good in the long term. But the way to really evaluate the movement is to ask, is the ideal that it stands for of minimizing human impact, is that a good idea? Is that the right way to think of things? Or is maximizing human flourishing the right way to think of things? And so that's why there needs to be a pro-human environmental movement to take over the issues that the green movement has falsely, uh, doesn't really deserve to because it's an anti-human environment. Uh, one follow. So you might be defining anti-human in context of what you think is best for humanity, when in reality, I, I guess I'm just wondering, I would say that the Green Movement would say they're also pro, or that they're also pro-human, but they see us going about it a different way. Um, do you acknowledge, or do you think that uh, it, So I think you have to way? distinguish between, I, I take, you have to distinguish between consistent and inconsistent uh, practitioners of something. But the actual ideal of minimizing impact is that is the ideal. That is a deadly ideal. And what you have is you have people, the most consistent people, they're often called deep greens, those are the people most willing to, um, to obviously oppose human life. So I, I, I mean the moral, I'll send out a link to some of the content, but the moral case for fossil fuels, one of the things I do in that book is I show the leaders repeatedly saying in one form or another, we don't care about humans, we accept these consequences. So you'll have, and even conventional people like Ted Turner says, well the ideal population for the earth is 300 million people. Like we should aspire to that. Like you can't say, oh I love humans and I want, I don't know the math, but 11 twelfths of you to die or something like that. I mean, and, and I don't want you to be able to have kids, it's like, oh I really love, you don't love humans. And it's just, it's when people say, it, I mean, I'll take a controversial example, but people's, it's a mistake to think that everybody cares about human beings, again, because it takes two things. One is you have to do it, you have to have the right human role, 
and you have to have it conscientiously. And I don't think most people have either as their clear ultimate goal. And if you don't have it as your clear ultimate goal, then you're not going to succeed. And I think it's the exact same thing as like, you know, the in certain religions, they say that, you know, they don't believe the medical <coughs> intervention is justified. And that their kids die. Now you could say, well, I think my I really care about my kid. But I don't think you do. Not as much. Well. Because you you put you put obedience over your kid's life. And so here, if you say, I want us to minimize our impact, this, that's, this is what, minimizing impact means, means, it means sacrifice, but it means, de, it means, if you think of the planet, it means dehumanizing the planet. To minimize human impact, taken to its logic, to its full logical conclusion, means that there should be no human beings. So if you say, my ideal means there should be none of us, we should all be dead. And then you say, oh, well, the green leaders, they really like us. No, but you can't have your ultimate goal be the mass death of the species. And then say, well, I really like you. And there's no, why would you ever accept an ideal that was anti-human at all when you don't need to? Any, any more questions? Yes? Yeah, one of the, um, I was trying to come up with, uh, with something about like the, the pushback on, on nuclear that we may be uh, be seeing is that it's the 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 repairs to the all nuclear plants are it can get um, uh, kind of expensive and it's one of the things that's that that's raising rates such as the these like huge multi uh, uh, hundred million dollar cost overruns that from uh, Excel's uh, um, Monticello uh, power plant. And, and also that it, and it is like that that nuclear cannot change its output quickly, mm -hmm. um, and, and provide backup for for solar and wind like like natural gas can. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what's the question? That was some of the uh, and. Uh, so so the, there's two mm -hmm. separate things. There's why nuclear might not be the most competitive product on a market that includes fossil fuels. I still think that's overwhelmingly because it's been oppressed for decades by the green movement. Um, but the other question is, if you thought fossil fuels carried with them catastrophic consequences, why you wouldn't support nuclear? So that's a different thing. So if you think fossil fuels are catastrophic from a climate perspective, my argument is, you have to support nuclear, because it's the only thing yeah. that scales. So you can say, oh, there's a cost overrun, but if, if it was really the future of the planet, you'd be willing to have a cost overrun. Mm -hmm. You'd probably get good at preventing. And, and when you said um, just uh, just earlier that the, the temperature as um, pr predictions of warming have not happened yet, it, it could very well be that the, yeah, the, the carbon has, has been absorbed into the oceans and that it, 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 it uh, so far it doesn't mean that it can never happen. Uh, um, a temperature spike can never happen like five years from now, yeah. just because it, it hasn't happened well, so far. Well, it's really unpredictable. I've been on a global warming question, so I'm going to mm -hmm. take that as a global warming question. Yeah. So the way to think about mm -hmm. so, so this, you know, ultimately what we want in terms of human flourishing is we want, among other things, to have a very as livable a climate as possible. So I mentioned before, one of the big things in there is if you want a livable climate, you need lots and lots of energy. So that's a big thing. So if fossil fuels provide energy, <coughs> they make the climate, climate more livable in that respect, and that's a big deal. Um, and if we make energy more expensive, the climate might become less livable. But you have these other variables, and another is, well, what a uh, CO2 also acts as a fertilizer. So that can be a significant thing. So the more atmospheric CO2 you have, all things being equal, the more plant growth. This is why. We have greenhouses, and in greenhouses, it, it has three times the amount of CO2 in that atmosphere as we do in ours, because that's optimal for plant growth. So from a plant growth perspective on a pure CO2 level, we're very suboptimal. We need to enrich it a lot more by burning a lot more coal. Right, but that, so that's, we have to think of all these things. And then, of course, we need to think of the greenhouse effect, right? So the greenhouse effect is technically the infrared absorber <coughs> effect. And so the phenomenon is that certain molecules, including carbon dioxide, um, through a couple of different processes absorb heat. So they have a certain amount of heat absorbing capacity. 
And then the question with that is how much heat absorbing capacity do they have? So you can imagine a couple scenarios. One is that um, every new molecule of CO2 warms more than the last one. So it would be like the first one warms this much, the second one warms this much, and the third one. So this would be like a geometric or exponential impact. And if that was true, we'd be screwed. Okay, it would be a big problem because you don't want an exponential effect. Or it could be linear, which would just be each one added the same amount of warming. And that would be a problem or not, depending on just what the, what the slope of it was. But actually, the effect is what's called a, a logarithmic or diminishing or decelerating effect. So that means every new molecule of CO2 we add, at least when we isolate it, warms less than the last one. So you get diminishing returns. So you have to basically, to get in the lab, to get like one, one or so degrees of, of increased temperature, you need to double the amount of CO2. So you have to add lots and lots and lots more CO2 uh, to warm. So if you just isolate it, this is what's known about the greenhouse effect. It's what's called a logarithmic effect. So on its own, you wouldn't expect this to be a very big problem. Because if you're talking about it taking a doubling to get even one degree warming or a little more than one degree warming, uh, and we haven't even come close to doubling it yet, and generally humans prefer warmer to colder, and we're talking very small shifts relative to history, and also, by the way, the, the planet is a very low point historically in terms of CO2. It's 1 20th its historical high, which was a very you know, plant flourishing period, and it's at a very low point temperature-wise. So there's nothing in the planet that is unprecedented. It's actually very low. If you sort of look at all of that, you wouldn't be alarmed. So then why are people alarmed? Well, the reason they say they're alarmed is because they say, well, we have these models which show that, yes, even though it's a logarithmic effect, even though you would expect mild manageable warming, maybe even desirable warming, there are what are called positive feedback loops in the atmosphere where just even adding a little bit of warming is going to set off this cascade and then suddenly we're going to all, it's just going to be an absolute disaster. Uh, okay, and so you ask, well, how can you demonstrate that? That's quite a claim, uh, especially because positive feedback loops are very rare in nature. Things don't sort of cycle out of control that way. That's why it hasn't happened in the four billion. <laughs> Things tend to actually get mitigated a lot. So you say, well, how does that happen? They say, well, we've got these models. That's a good way to go, right? So if you model, you're claiming certain mechanisms are at work of positive feedback loops. If you say, well, I can model, one way to test it is to say, well, we can make a really good model, and it can predict temperatures. And without this model, any other model wouldn't predict the temperature. So that would be really good. So what happened? They made that model, and it completely failed, and it overpredicted everything. Every version of it overpredicted, and it turned out, um, uh, I'll, I'll send a link in, in the email we send out, but I have a podcast called Power Hour. You can hear basically every aspect of this issue to more, more than you would ever want to know. But it's basically the models are complete failures, um, which is not surprising because the understanding of the atmosphere is just, it's so complex and we don't know that much. So what's happened in the actual atmosphere though? What's happened is there's been a mild and manageable amount of warming just like you would expect from the, the from the fact that it was already warming before we started using CO2 emissions, that CO2 emissions have a mild warming effect. So it's just, it's a really uninteresting phenomenon. Uh, one second. And then the, so here's my question, why do people actually care about it? And the reason they actually care about it, I believe, is the same thing I've been talking about, because people have this idea that it's wrong to impact nature. So they think if we add CO2 to the atmosphere, we're doing a wrong thing, we broke a commandment. Thou shalt not add CO2 to the atmosphere, <laughs> and thus we're going to hell. So it's a hell narrative, right? It's even global warming. So it's, it's really that we sinned, we, we changed nature, and we're going to be punished. And there, the, I mentioned this is earth worship. It's like the earth is a god, and we didn't respect God's perfection, and so God smited us, if that's the right <laughs> conjugation. <laughs> But, but it's, it's really this view, it's, it, and we really treat the earth as a god that's mad at us and that takes revenge on us and that likes us. And it's just a rock with an atmosphere that we can study scientifically. And in this case, it's not a very interesting, the amount of CO2 we put in the atmosphere isn't very interesting. Yes? I was just gonna say that the outside layers of the atmosphere are actually experiencing cooling while the inside layer is experiencing a warming due to the uh, 
So I mean, there's a lot of different things going on in different layers of the atmosphere. What I ultimately care about is, is there a dramatic temperature trend of the kind that was predicted? Because if there was, I'd be the first person sounding the alarm because it'd be very bad for me and future children and grandchildren and whatnot. So it's, it's really, are we seeing anything alarming that would, that would confirm the idea of massive positive feedbacks? And so far, no. And, but I should say, you have, you should, this, we shouldn't stop studying this issue and paying attention to it, but people need to be honest about it. And as I said before, they absolutely need to be honest about the solution. So if they think there's a problem with CO2, or even if they just want sort of insurance, uh, they should very much be against the fact that the government makes it almost impossible to build a nuclear power plant. Yes? In your experience with all this, collecting all this information, isn't it true that some climatologists um, completely ignore the effects of solar radiation and possibly producing warming that we, we may observe? Some sure. That we may observe? Well, I mean, the way to think of the global climate system is it's a system. So it's a system that many things drive what's happening in the atmosphere and oceans and whatnot. And the way we're taught about it, and the way I was taught, was that only one thing matters, which is CO2. Right, that's the only thing. So you have eight-year-olds being taught about climate, but they're not taught what climate is or how clouds work or whatever. They're just taught about this one satanic gas, <laughs> CO2. Right, and, and it's evil. And, and if it was a problem, that would be the worst way to do it. Right, because it's just making people dogmatists and not clear. What you should do is you should teach people how the whole atmosphere works and then explain, oh, there's this one variable, there's this one driver that's a big problem and, uh, to focus on it. So why isn't that the case? Well, for the movement, it's just propaganda purposes because the CO2 is the, they don't care about climate, they're not interested in science, they're interested in opposing industry. Um, so it's not, they're not interested in millirems of radiation, they're interested in opposing nuclear. Um, from a, from a scientist's perspective, though, it's, it's as disturbing because it has to do with uh, how research decisions get made. And at this point, the government has an essential monopoly on research since it funds the research. And when the government funds research, that means the politicians fund research. And politicians then set the agenda, depending on who's in Congress, who's in government. And uh, the people who, the field of climate science was very, very small and obscure until this CO2 attack on industry became popular. So it's no surprise that the funding went toward show how CO2 was destroying the planet. So the way to think about it is the, the number one question that people are trying to answer in the research today is not how does the climate work, it's how does CO2 screw up the climate. And when you ask that question, you get the answer you deserve. Right? Right. <coughs> time for one more question, by the way. Uh, did you ask a question already? I did ask a question. Okay. Sure. Do you didn't ask one yet, did you? Okay, you're last. Um, you good. A lot of leaders of, the, of different countries get together at what I think is called an Earth Summit or a Climate Summit of uh -huh. every few years maybe. And yeah. I was just wondering, what are they doing when they're there? I haven't really kept too close to tabs on it. But what is it that they're trying to accomplish and what sort of effect is that going to have on us eventually if they do it enough or leave enough? So there's, there's different categories of these. Uh, the, the UN holds one. <coughs> the UN gets together a bunch of people. These are always very luxurious, so people like to go to them and use lots of fossil fuels to, to get them. <laughs> but they, you know, they hold them, and so that produces what are called assessment reports, which are then, the, the function of those is really for somebody to issue a press release saying every scientist agrees with my agenda. Uh, so you can research that. Also, I'll send a link in the email to Power, which discusses these. But they're all, I think the, the point, the important thing about them is they're all created by highly political bodies. And so the agenda of those bodies gets embodied in the, uh, in the findings. And so, so for instance, at the UN, I've heard fairly credible scientists say that some of, what they do is they sum up research, so there's interesting stuff in the 2,500 pages that they aggregate, but nobody reads that. They have what's called a summary for policymakers, and that's a bunch of political officials in a room, like smoking at night and drinking and whatnot, you know, literally, like, will you agree to this formulation? Will you agree to that? And what they're looking for is some, is some killer sentence that they can quote that allows them to take action. Now the other thing that started to happen is these summits 
that are more political, like what was called COP21 in Paris last year, where, and there was a predecessor called Kyoto a long time ago, and that's where company, countries make these sort of quasi-legal commitments to reduce fossil fuel use. Uh, and, and I think those are, the consequence of that is if they do it, then, you know, that makes energy more expensive and it makes people's lives worse, and particularly poorer people's lives worse. You know, sort of upside to that is they tend to break all of their promises. So it's, it's weird to hope that the countries are as dishonest as they have been in the past. Uh, I think the real thing that needs to happen, though, is we need to make, give, it, give an incentive for people to do the right thing by spreading. So you know, that, uh, hopefully, you guys will, will stay in touch. It was really interesting uh, talking to you. Great questions, and uh, thanks for having me.